Well, thank you for inviting me into your office or your home. I'm Pastor Steve Altai with Park Street Christian Church in El Dorado Springs, Missouri, with message number three in reframing how Jesus changes the way we see the world. With Jesus changes your attitude. Again, we're looking at the book of Philippians during this several week study. So we're gonna be the latter part of chapter one of Philippians into chapter two. If you wanna find that in your Bible, Philippians one and the early parts of chapter two, the first 11 verses. We're gonna be focused on how Jesus changes your attitude. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity. You're so good and patient loving and kind and you're so you're so good your grace is incredible uh, and your truth feeds our spirit with what we need to live every day so i pray that you'll use this time through your instrument to accomplish whatever you desire in the lives of those who see or hear this thank you for this opportunity Thank you for the good news of Jesus, his gospel, and we pray in his name. Amen. I love the book of Philippians. Um, just 104 verses, 16 different times. There's the word joy or rejoicing. But I also love it because, as we learned earlier, it was written uh, in circumstances where the author was in either a prison cell or under house arrest, chained to a Roman guard nonetheless. And we wouldn't equate those circumstances with being joyful, not at all. But I also love this short letter because it's easy to understand. It's not filled with a lot of detailed, hard to grasp theological terms. It's uh, not confusing. It's pretty straightforward, practical, helpful material that we all need, I certainly need. Two weeks ago in week one, we learned that in Philippians 1, 6, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. So as long as you are alive, God is not done with you. He is not done. He's still working. No matter what you face, what you're going through, what mistakes you've made, he is not done. Last week we learned that we have a testimony because of our experiences, our struggles, and the harmed times of life, God works with us through those to carry that weight so that something beautiful emerges. That our struggle is an opportunity for God to grow something powerful in us, the Christ-like character of Jesus. But also our struggle is an opportunity for others to see God clearly because we're being refined. And our struggle, thirdly, is an opportunity to fuel the faith of other people. So today we're going to look at 15 verses, including one of the most quoted passages in all the Bible. We're going to learn that when we reframe our attitude, it will bring joy to our hearts on the inside, regardless of what may be going on on the outside. You can think you're having a bad day. You think about sometimes when things are just not going well for you. And then something happened that completely changed your circumstances and therefore your attitude. Let's say you've been looking forward for two or three weeks to eating at your favorite restaurant. And you go with a friend. And it's a little disappointing because the service is slower than it's ever been before. And... When you get your food, there's problems with it, and it's not right. You finally, even though it's awkward, you don't want to, but you ask to send it back, and it comes back to you, but it's still not exactly right. And finally, you kind of say to your friend, you know, this has never happened to me before, but I'm not sure I'm gonna come back here. But a few minutes later, up walks the manager, and he says, hey, I understand that your experience tonight has been subpar. So you know what, your entire meal, both of you, is all taken care of for free. I hope that you'll give us another chance. Oh yeah, we'll give you another chance. All of a sudden everything is fine in the universe because of those few moments. Today, I want us to see how the resurrected Christ can permanently change our attitude because of the hope that he's given to us. Our attitudes are the actions, the foundation upon which our actions are built, which we're going to look at next week. 
we're going to focus on three different ingredients that combined can create a reframed attitude. The first is a life of consistency. So we pick up the account here in Philippians chapter 1. We're going to start with verse 27. Okay? Towards the end of the chapter, Paul writes, Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. One of the biggest turnoffs for those outside of a relationship with Christ, one of the biggest um, turnoffs of those outside the church is a duplicity in the lives of professing Christians. To say one thing and yet not live it out, to live another way. That word uh, is hypocrisy, which means literally two faces. It's being double-minded. One way with one group, another with another situation, another group. Paul says, whatever happens, whatever the circumstances that you encounter, you must choose to act consistently in the same God-honoring way. I'm to be the same person I am when I'm holding a communion cup or a remote control. I'm going to be the same way in the church as I am with my wife in the family room at home. Or the same room, same way in a motel, hotel room 500 miles from home as I am at home with my wife in the family room. And so consistently, living consistently, representing Jesus well, makes the gospel much easier to understand. Now the word gospel, of course, literally means good news. 1 Corinthians 15, of Apostle Paul is writing there and he tells us what the gospel is, that what the good news is. It's the testimony about the death, resur burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the good news that we have to share. That Christ is our saving king. He predicted his death and his resurrection, and anybody who walks out of their own grave having died and predicting they were going to do that is whoever they say they are. And so, Paul is saying, when your life aligns with the life of Christ, and all of a sudden it makes the gospel easier for other people to understand that, that what they see and hear all the way through is consistent. That you believe Jesus died for you, and you're living in such a way knowing that your sins are forgiven, because he conquered the grave, that you have the hope of eternal life too. And that should affect what people see when they hear you and see you. It comes to consistency. When it comes to consistency, we struggle at times because Satan, though he knows his doom is coming and it's sure and it's set, he's extremely busy, he is real, and he is our enemy. The Bible refers to him as the father of lies, the prince of darkness, Lucifer, Satan, the deceiver, the devil. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus said, speaking of him, he's come to steal, kill, and destroy. Speaking of Satan. And he's committed to doing whatever he can to try to rob the joy out of your life, to disrupt your life, so that your decisions are dictated by external circumstances rather than the foundation that you have in your life in Christ. Okay? Okay there are circumstances that we face when all of a sudden in an instant those things threaten to change our attitude about things in life you know the bible warns us about satan and his intent when you can nearly have something in your grass he'll come and he'll grab it and steal it and remove it maybe it's a relationship you thought was going someplace or positive health news <clears throat> is followed by a bad report six months later maybe it was a promotion or a raise that you're promised that didn't happen <coughs> or a pregnancy that once again ends with a miscarriage but part of reframing your attitude is striving for consistency in your daily walk understanding you're on a daily journey with christ who reframes your attitude no matter what the painful circumstances are going on that you may have to endure temporarily. Paul says, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, the Apostle Paul says that we are to praise God in the good times and the bad times. He says, rejoice always. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18. Rejoice always, pray continually, 
Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. A life of consistency. When a Christian and non-Christian are going through the same struggle, the same kind of hardship, the world should be able to see the difference between how the two handle it. They should be able to tell a difference in your attitude because of Christ. Philippians 1.27, whatever happens, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. There's a second ingredient you need to reframe your attitude. That's the spirit of unity. The spirit of unity. Look at with at Philippians chapter 1, the very end with me, verse 27 and the first part of 28. Whatever happens, to conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whenever I come or and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. Do you hear all those references to unity? Stand firm in one spirit, striving together. Striving together as one for the faith. Stand fast, stand fast. The phrase stand firm in some translations says stand fast. It's a term that they were very acquainted with back when they first received this letter from Paul describing the way Roman soldiers would often go into battle. They would lock their shields together, huddle behind their shields, and they could take all the fiery arrows the enemy was shooting. Their feet plant, firmly planted together Locking their shields together, they could find protection together behind it in unity. All the way down the line. They couldn't be hit. And then when the enemy had fired their best shot, then they could advance and go on the offensive. They were saying, hey, united we stand, divided we fall. The Philippians understood that imagery well, given the background of Philippi as a military outpost serving as a home for many retired Roman soldiers. Paul is conveying to the Christians in the church at Philippi they were a brand of brothers and sisters, their family, and that the Christian faith should reflect their unity in the face of opposition and persecution, just as it's crucial for an arm, a unit of armed forces to work together to look out for each other, to have each other's back. Now, I talk about sports, use sports for illustrations frequently. There's so many good life lessons in sports. You might watch a team, your favorite football or basketball team, even baseball team. And a wise coach will often say, hey, look at your uniform. It will have a team name or logo on the front of it quite often with their last name and their number on the back. And a wise coach will periodically remind them before a game, hey, you play for the name on the front. You don't play for the name on the back. You play for the name on the front as a team. You're united to a point where you're not worried about individual achievements. It's all for the team. And when you play that way, then your individual achievements, they end up better. They're for a greater cost. In this passage, Paul suggesting that the church is a team. We're one team and we're playing, we're living the game of life for the person that's on the front, the person above all, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ, our saving king. Why is Paul stressing this? It's because these recipients were in the midst of intimidation and persecution and opposition, and he did not want them to be scattered, but to be united, because there really aren't any strong Lone Ranger believers. So he says, stand firm in one spirit because while your faith may well be tested on a daily basis, he says, I don't want you to fear those who oppose you. That phrase, being frightened or terrified, has the idea of an inward fear caused by an outward stimulus. In this particular case, it was persecution. Because those living in Philippi were facing it, and it was an extremely violent time in history. But what was it that Jesus said back in Matthew 10, verse 28? He said, don't be afraid of those who can kill the body, but can't touch the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. In other words, fear God. Have a healthy, reverential fear of Him. 
But for those who disagree with our faith or try to make our life difficult, you don't need to fear them. Because you're not in this battle by yourself. You have the Holy Spirit. You're the house of God. He abides in you, living inside you, and he binds you together with other believers. Over in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25, the writer says, Let us consider how we may spur one another on to love and good deeds. Well, that's a whole lot easier if you're together rather than scattered, right? Not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another all the more as you see the day, day capital D, day approaching. So when you are a part of a regular community of believers, there's a support system that comes to your aid when you're going through a rough time. There are people who are there for you. That's why it's important for you to come, if you can, if at all possible, and worship with other believers. We live a life of worship all the time. We don't gather only to worship. That's not the only time we worship. We worship through our work, through our jobs, our careers, through our relationships with other believers, with other people. But there is something powerful about the synergy developed when people are worshiping together. Because we see there's others evidenced by their presence who are trying to live consistently for Christ as you are. It inspires you to want to do the same. It enables you to serve more effectively as a part of the body of Christ. And for those of you who might be watching this online, you'll get fed. But coming in person allows you to be more a more active part of a team. It enables you to help feed others. And you have this opportunity to encourage others and you utilize your gifts to serve them and also to make a difference in the community together with others were more impactful. So I would highly recommend you get a copy of the binder, What is Church and How Important Is It? I'd be glad to sh ship you one um, if you'll take time to study through it, okay? But if you're part of our family of believers here at Park Street Christian Church in El Rio Springs, Missouri, and you haven't been attending, maybe you got out of the habit during COVID, okay? And I'm just saying to you out there that we love you and you're missed. Now, I know there are some physical issues that prevent some people from coming or even family commitments that biblically you have a, a, a commitment you made to minister to family. That's important that you do that. Just going to church, attending services, it doesn't make you Christian, of course. It's not the only time you're a Christian. But we are stronger together than we are apart. Because when the church is unified, when the church is together, God's glorified. And if you're watching this through Facebook Live or on our YouTube channel or Facebook page, and you don't really have a church home, you need to get up and you need to get going and get involved someplace. And again, if you'll contact me, I'll be glad to help you find a good church home wherever you live. Now, in the next few verses, Paul's going to tell them, don't be afraid of the opposition, the persecution that you're facing that's going to get worse before it gets better because it's granted you two opportunities. So let's look and see what those two opportunities are that Paul's going to tell the church of Philippi they have. Verse 29, for it's been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but to suffer for him. Two, believe, two, two, two opportunities. So Christ says, you've been granted the opportunity, Paul says, to believe in Christ. Have you ever thought about how incredibly privileged you are to grow up in this nation where you have the opportunity to pretty easily hear the message of Christ? Um, there's more tools and resources and Christian radio stations and things like that available at this point in history than any time previously. But most of the world doesn't have freedom of religion like we have and the opportunity to. And so I would encourage you to go to joshuaproject.org and pray regularly. You can get an email every day about a different unreached people group someplace in the world. They might be a very small people group of just a couple thousand, up to several thousands and hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of people in a particular people group that have not been reached. They may have the scripture translated in their language. They may not. Well, then, you pr then you pray for translators and you support translators. But it seems to me that's the very least that we can do 
when we have been blessed with all the wealth of opportunities and resources, technology that we have, and we hear the message of Christ so readily, is to pray for those who haven't had those blessings yet. And yet we would all say that the majority, we don't want to suffer those kind of things that so many people do and, and so many Christians are going through right now in China and Iran and Iraq and all kinds of other places. And yet most people would say they have been deepened the most and grown the strongest through those kinds of experiences. We don't want them, but when they come, they're the best for us and we grow a lot more then. We talked a little bit last Sunday about how Jesus reframes our struggles if we allow him to. Again, it's an opportunity for God to grow something powerful inside of us when what's not important kind of gets crushed away. We get refined and something beautiful flows out. And our struggles are an opportunity for others to see God more clearly. The, the peripheral, the chaff kind of stuff disappears and God sees and people see the real value of God in our lives. They understand the gospel more clearly when we're facing trouble struggles in, at any other time. And our struggles are an opportunity to fuel the faith of other people. And yet, the seasons of greatest growth for all Christians is always begun as the result of intense opposition. See this in the early months and years of the church in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 5, the apostles are arrested. Why are they arrested? because they're preaching the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And they get arrested. We'll pick up in Acts 5, verse 40. So the authorities called the apostles in. They had them flogged, and they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus. And then they let them go. Well, they're not going to listen to these guys. They spent three years with Jesus. They walked with him. They talked with him. They ate with him. They heard him predict his own death. They watched the Romans drive spikes into his hands and his his feet, they saw him suffer unspeakable in his scourging and crucifixion, a horrific death. He died the most horrific and agonizing death possible. And then a couple of days later, they saw, they, he, was back, he came back to life and they saw him in a matter of days. They're not going to stop talking about this resurrected king, the saving King Jesus. Verse 41, Acts 5, 41, the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing that they had been counted worthy of disgrace for the name. And day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. What a strange response to being beaten. They celebrate. They celebrate they've been granted the opportunity to suffer because they were suffering from the name capital N, the name of Jesus, their master, their Lord, their saving king, the one who death could not keep. And Jesus had told them to expect suffering, expect persecution, opposition if they followed in Jesus' footsteps, and he'd endured it. Therefore, the opposition didn't seem to dissuade the first Christians. In fact, it inspired them. You realize that suffering enhanced their testimony and deepened their faith. You see, unity brings joy. They felt honored they had the opportunity to do that for Jesus, what he had done, what he had experienced to a certain extent, because they've been united with Christ through the suffering. So here's our ingredients. Live a life of consistency with God's help in a spirit of unity, secondly. And then the third ingredient is an attitude of humility. An attitude of humility. Let's pick up our text back in Philippians, the second chapter, beginning with verse 1 through 4. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. What, what, would, what might happen if you were to start every day just deciding every person you come in contact with, you're going to give value to them? 
So you're going to find a way to serve them, to honor them in such a way that they know they have worth. They may not understand why initially, but you're going to look people in the eye. You're going to treat them with kindness, even if they're opposed to you and and they are uh, a pendulum swing apart from you and many of your views about life. But you're going to go out of your way to do something for someone that doesn't expect it and doesn't necessarily deserve it to try to build, build a bridge to them. That's how it starts, is by valuing other person as a person who died, who Jesus died for. Look at Philippians 2, verses 5 to 8. Here's the key of to refraining, reframing your attitude. Your attitude, Paul says, should be the same as Christ Jesus, who in being very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, but rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So here's Jesus up on the cross, can you imagine? And he had power to come down from the cross that he was nailed to. He could have come down. He has that power. He has that authority. He could have called legions of angels to come to his defense. He chose not to. Why did he stay there? For me and for you. For the people that you meet this week. That's why you should value them. Because he knows if he comes down from the cross that we're going to have no hope because he was the only perfect sacrifice that could pay for our sins completely and provide for us the ladder to heaven, the pathway to heaven. It says he made himself nothing. It means to empty yourself, pour yourself out. And Jesus did that through his punishment, his scourging, his crucifixion. He endured the pain of the cross was crucified the worst possible death imaginable at that time because of us, for us, in our place. But as the story of the cross of Christ becomes so routine for us that more, more stressed over our accidental piercings, little nick or cut we get, rather than the intentional sacrifice of Jesus, has time sanitized the suffering of our Savior to the point where it actually no longer touches your heart? But that's why we observe communion here in our congregational worship every Sunday. We pause for a moment to reflect specifically what those little emblems represent. Remembering Jesus' loving sacrifice to recall and to repent of sins that previous week to remember the debt paid at the cross it's been said the world drinks to forget but the Christian drinks to remember and we remember that Christ what Christ did for us and all those in his family our brothers and sisters in Jesus whether we're sitting across from them in a church building or they're living around the world they're still part of your family huge family so what happens to Jesus after he submits to God's will, being the ultimate servant and sacrificing himself to become a sin offering in our place? Look at verses 9 through 11. Philippians 2, 9 and 11. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know, we love rags to riches stories person that seemingly has nothing and through hard work and determination they somehow make it they become a success from the world's perspectives we love those stories but jesus story is just the opposite it's riches to rags and he leaves the hails of glory in heaven for the nails of calvary and he comes down to earth and he submits himself to the Father's will. And he becomes sin offering for us as he prayed to God, Father, not my will, but yours be done. 
And so what happens is he does the Father's will. He sacrifices his life. And Paul sums it up well in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, one of my favorite passages. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. You've seen ladders. We see them commonly. But I want to challenge you to think, to have this image in your mind of a tall ladder representing Christ coming down, descending down to the depths from riches to rags to benefit us, what we celebrate at Christmas, the incarnation of Christ. We think of wanting to climb the ladder of success and status and wealth. Jesus gave up all his to come down to us. Jesus couldn't have been any higher. He's with the Father in heaven. Philippians 2, verse 5 again. Picture where he is and what he does for your attitude should be the same of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by coming obedient to death, even even death on a cross. Throughout the Bible, the cross is referred to as the lowest type of death. It's called cursed throughout the Bible. Cursed if you died on a cross or on a tree. But that's how Jesus chose to die, on our behalf. But he didn't stay in the tomb. He walked out of the grave just like he promised that he was going to do. And because of that, we have hope. We have the assured hope we're going to we're going to be brought out of our grave someday resurrected and we're going to have the fullness then of the hope our living hope of eternal life but notice again in verses 9 through 11 jesus therefore god exalted him back to the highest place and gave him the name that's above every name that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's where he's at. At the highest peak. Seated right next to the Heavenly Father. And just waiting, waiting for the Father to say, it's time to go. And Jesus will return. First time he came to incarnation, he came in love. We celebrated at Christmas time, the greatest gift ever given. But the second time he's going to come, he's going to come in power as the conquering, saving king. You see, in the Christian life, you don't ascend the ladder of greatness. Again, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, some have referred to this as God's planned poverty. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Jesus himself said in Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, I've talked to people over the years on occasion who say, well, I know that I need to, I need to acknowledge Jesus as Lord and Savior. And that someday I will bow the knee to him. When he comes back, man, I'm going to bow my knee to him. Well, you won't have any choice then. Now you have a choice to do it willingly. You'll be forced to do it when Christ returns. It was C.S. Lewis who said, you get no credit for bowing when it becomes impossible for you to stand. You won't be able to stand on that day. You'll fall on your knees before him. You'll be forced to. So why not turn to him and do it willingly now? So the warning and the admonition and the encouragement is simple. Live a life of consistency for the glory of God with a spirit of unity. You're not in this by yourself and do it with an attitude of humility. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness, your patience, your grace, for your planned poverty to make us rich. Just the last two or three days, somebody won a billion dollar Powerball, one of the highest lottery pots ever awarded. And from what I understand, if I remember right, one person, the rich. And yet, the richest of all rich, Jesus became poor, crucified on the cross, poverty poor, 
so that we can have wealth that endures at last, an inheritance reserved and kept in heaven for us by your power. And we praise you for that treasure that is better than any earthly lottery or inheritance that can't perish, spoil, or fade. And we praise you for it. And I pray that anyone listening or watching who doesn't have that treasure will reach out. We've all got lots to learn, but we've got to start someplace. Would you help them to humbly admit that, admit they need you, and trust you, and let you lead? Thank you, Father, for people you put in our lives to help us on this journey. We don't have to grope through this life in the dark. You've given us the light of life in your son Jesus and in your living word that we treasure. So help us to turn to you and rely completely on you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And again, I ask you to uh, reach out to me if we're not personally known to each other, but you have questions or maybe you're seeking some answers about life, becoming a Christian. Send me a text if we're not acquainted with one another so I know uh, just know who you are. Area code six six zero three four two three zero six eight, and then I'll respond, and we can begin some dialogue and some communication, and uh, I'll do the best I can to help you find the truth of God's word for your life, wherever you're at, and do the best I can to connect you with a family of believers that can be your family and walk with you through this life. And once again, thank you for giving me this time to speak into your life. All for the glory of God. In Jesus' name.